welcome back. This is uh, Hollywood Tales. My buddy Ari Sandel is with us, uh, and Blake Barty, my co-host, and Wolf Romero is over here uh, engineering the whole <coughs> thing. Is this episode six? Seven. Is it seven already? Episode seven. We just started this podcast. Uh, it's called Hollywood Tales because I bring all my friends who have to tell their best Hollywood tale. But before we get there, Ari, what's up, buddy? Thank you for coming on. My pleasure. How are you? I'm welcome, good. Welcome. Um, I haven't seen you in a minute. It's been a like while. Like physically seen you. Well, you know, COVID yeah. has everyone in their little encampments. Mm. Um, Ari and I met 20 plus years ago through a mutual friend who also did this podcast, Peter Billingsley, um, who, by the way, you know, they're making a sequel to I saw. Christmas I saw. Star <laughs> in Hungary. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. I, I guess I it's cheaper works. to shoot there yeah, and it's yeah, snowing yeah. all the time, so yeah, it makes yeah, yeah. sense. All right. Jesus. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Ari used to work with Peter, and I don't know, you want to tell the story? I think it's funny how we kind of met from your perspective. I, uh, I, Peter Billingsley was my boss. I was a, basically <laughs> a PA getting coffee. And um, one day he said, he was probably 27, I think I was 24, maybe. And he said, hey, I need you to go pick up my friend. Uh, Ahmed. I said, okay, Ahmed. I was writing his name. What's his last name? Ahmed. I said, what do you know? What's his last name? He's like, his name is Ahmed Ahmed. And I'm like, get out of here. I'm like, you know a guy whose name is Ahmed Ahmed. His first name is, yes, yes. And I did, I thought that was ridiculous. So I went to go pick him up at, you were saying with Vince, with Vince Vaughn. So I'm 24. I'm going, oh, I'm going to Vince Vaughn's house. This is so Hollywood. I'm going to Vince Vaughn's house to pick up a guy named Ahmed Ahmed, when it's probably a fake dude. <laughs> and I went and picked him up, and he's like the friendliest guy. He comes, he's like, "Hey, man, how are you?" Get in the car. <laughs> and as we're driving back to the office, we just start he's bonded, yucking it up yeah. and talking about whatever. He's like, "We should go have drinks later." I was like, "All right, sure." So then that's how it kind of started. And then you and Peter and and Vince later on, and right. you know, a bunch of us used to go pal around for a bit. And then later, uh, I was visiting you and Peter and Vince on the set of the breakup. This is years later, right? And uh, in Chicago, and Vince had come up with the idea of, well, I want to go on the tour with some comics. And he said, hey, Ari, why don't you come along? Do you remember where that happened? Yeah, it was at a steakhouse. Steakhouse, yeah. Gib Gibson's. Yeah, and I, at the time, didn't want to do it. I had just started trying to be in the, uh, in the movie business as a director. And I, I was like, listen, I can't leave L.A. For, to just go and hold a camera and you know hang out with you guys. And as much fun as it sounds, I, I, it's a profession, I can't leave the business right now. Mm. And I remember you actually called me and you said, listen, if Vince Vaughn calls and says you should come on tour with him, you should just do it. You <laughs> yeah. have nothing else going on. I'm like, all right. Well, fine. hold on. So let me interject. You had West Bank story, which we'll get to in a minute, in the bank already. Like, that Yeah, was no, I shot. had done West Bank story. West Bank story had come out. So it had he, gone to Sundance. I had a manager and an agent now. I was meeting all over town. I was so while reading the Vince scripts Vaughn to thing, try to get, right. to, to get a movie going. This was happening, right. And, and I just for fun went to Chicago to see all you guys. I remember you, the you said, hey, I, I just want to be a fly on the wall. Do you mind if I come out there and I'll put myself up and whatever? You like, mean in the, you yeah, to, on the set, a break. And, I, and I, yeah. I called Pete and, and I asked Vince. They're like, yeah, it's, it's cool. And you came out. You know, I just wanted to get like the blessing, right? And we hung out and it was fun. Like it was a fun, fun time. But I remember specifically Vince had this because he would, he would come to Dublin's every Tuesday, remember, and like the comedy store. And he was like, I got a month off. I just bought a tour bus. Right. We were all, there was like 12 of us. Sebastian Maniscalco was there, Caparello, Brad Ernst. On tour, yeah. Billingsley, no, at the, at the dinner. Oh, at the dinner. Oh, yeah, that's right. Rio, Pisani. Like, remember, it was yeah. like all the, like that insulated crew. And then everybody yeah. kind of said, yeah. And then I called you and I said, just do it. Like, if, if you don't have So, yeah, I, well, I signed up to just go and be, because I used to field produce with Peter Billingsley on the show, the TV show that we worked in. When I was a PA, eventually they promoted what me. What was to, that to, uh, show It was called The X Show. It was like the a late show, night yeah. guys talk show. It was like The View, uh, Gary but for Allenback. dudes. Right. And I used to do field producing with with Peter, so I knew what that was like. So I thought I was signing up for, I'll go hold a camera and I'll help Peter do some field producing. And then like two days in, it was everyone was drowning because so, we had no plan, we had no crew. And Vince said at one point, he's like, all right, you're going to be the director. And I'm like, What? So Vince and originally <laughs> was going to direct this documentary. Right. And two days in, he was just like, it's too much. And he went to Ari. It was, was too much like, for everybody. I mean, it was, everything it was, intense. was too much. And this was not a thought out. This <laughs> sounded really good on paper. Yeah. We had no crew. We had nothing. So every it day. It was planned in every 12 day, days. Every day we would load into a new City. location. Right. 
and we would have to train the in-house crew on our show right. when the music cues were, when the lighting cues were, and it was a nightmare because you know they're all professionals, but they know their thing. They don't know this one, and we're and we're three hours away from a show. Yeah. So every day was a heart attack. On top of that, Vince wanted to turn this into a documentary. So the documentary was starting to become about what a debacle this was. Mm. So he said, "Do you want to? You'll do. You'll direct it." And I'm like, "Wait, what's? What are we even doing here?" Because I thought I was going to just no hold a beer right. and a camera, <laughs> and I was kind of on a vacation a little bit. And he's like, "No, no, we're making a documentary about what it's like to be a comic on the road and tying it into, you know, the, a little bit of the country music scene." And I went, "Okay, so." <laughs> I, it kind of just happened trial by fire. And by the it. way, when I because I was on this tour, watching Ari like your work ethic was incredible. Like you had a really systematic, you know, regiment. You know, because Vince had put a lot of pressure on you. Well, I like, put the pressure on myself. I right. remember calling my dad. My father's from Israel, and I remember calling my dad. And he's like, "How is it out there?" I'm like, um, "Do it in his voice." Well, they, they I, I'm like, they just promoted me. <laughs> To director, my dad's like, of course they're going to promote you. <laughs> Some of the greatest directors were pro uh, greatest generals were promoted in the field of battle, <laughs> which is such an Israeli thing to say. Uh, and I'm like, Dad, please. He's like, I'm going to tell everyone. I'm like, tell no one, because I'm telling you honestly, they may fire me by tomorrow. <laughs> That's how precarious everything is out here. No, I don't know what's going on. I honestly have no no clue. It really, happened. literally, was the Wild West. And yeah. By the way, I know his dad, nuts. and how that's many, the great. How many hours of footage did you have to edit? Hundreds. Like we shot in thirty thousands. days. So here's the thing. So we brought on another camera person. So we had three people shooting camera, two camera and me. Right. And you, I had, I got the least sleep because you know sometimes they're up till four in the morning. Sometimes they're just talking at four in the morning. Yeah. But I'm filming that because maybe that's you don't know what the fuck the, the Bro, documentary we're, is. We're can on I, the, I, the bus. The Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 okay. you can, yeah, you can okay, curse here. Sure. So sometimes <laughs> you don't know what... When you're making a documentary, it's different than a film. Okay, when a fil you're following a film, you're, follow you're following a script. Right. When you're making a documentary, you're following multiple storylines at once. Right. And you have to be aware when those storylines are dying out and new storylines are picking up, you have to be very conscious of it because if, if a new storyline is picking up, you have to realize, well, wait a minute, maybe that's what this is going to be about. Now you have to go back and shoot some footage so you have enough setup for that. Mm -hmm. So you can tell that story. So at one point, this was about how the bus doesn't work and everything's falling apart. And then that we figured that out by day eight. So that's no longer the story. And then at one point, it was about going to country music places, but that wasn't enough. And what it really ended up being, Vince required two things. He said, I want you to interview the comics five minutes before they go on mm. stage and five minutes after. He right. felt like that's the most visceral part of it. The yeah. nervousness going on and the talking immediately afterwards. And then I want you to interview them each day just about you know, comedy. Well, after five days of interviewing people, you, you run out of shit to talk about. So it starts to get a lot more personal. Uh, not me. Right. <laughs> but I mean, you I'm run out of topics. Uh, so uh, you run out of topics <laughs> regarding comedy. So it becomes right. a lot more personal. So right. we started talking about their, their, how do they get into comedy, right. their family life, family, their right. family, their friends, you know, their fears, their hopes, their desires. So, you know, it starts to become, you start to realize like, wow, this movie is really about what the craft of comedy is and what does it take to be a comedian. And each one had their own journey. Ahmed had a very different journey than John mm -hmm. Caparulo, yeah. who had a very different journey than Sebastian Maniscalco or Brett Ernst. And so some of it's about the show and a lot of it becomes about these guys, these four guys. And um, we shot 600 hours, I think, right. which is insane. Right. And took the, us a year to edit. Into... Took us a year to edit we, to a two-hour movie. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it was... And you got these guys stand-up on there, too. So you have their stand-up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a couple of questions. Um, working with Sebastian and seeing, like, where he's at now, did you see that coming? Or Nobody saw, nobody saw that. that coming to that degree. I mean, if, if you're I mean, asking he, he's me... He's selling out stadiums. Oh, yeah, I know. If like you're asking football. me my personal opinion, Sebastian's set was one of my favorite. I didn't know it at the time, but in in watching your guys' comedy over and over and over and over and over and over and over mm. in, in editing, I started to really be a student of all of your techniques. Mm. Things that maybe you aren't even always aware of, where where you might do a certain tick or it might do a certain this or that. Right. And maybe you're aware, maybe you're doing it on purpose, maybe you're not. And you learn so much about the people. I actually, I, th I think I said this later to Sebastian. I said, all of us in the editing room have our, feel like we're your best friend because we've spent the last eight months with you every <laughs> single day. And all we do is interact with you through the screen by editing. 
but you're not a part of this. So I'm like, it, it, I was friends with Sebastian, but I'm like, you don't know that the, uh, you don't know the other editors. So we were at the premiere. I'm like, these editors feel as close to you as I do. Who's it? Dan Leventhal. Dan and Leventhal. Who and, else? Um, Mike something. Uh, no, Matt, uh, Mike, uh, Jim. That's right. Jim. Um, and, uh, so I say they've spent every hour with you. So they feel like they know you and you don't have that. You're not bringing that to this, but they're bringing that. So it's a weird kind of dynamic. Um, but yeah, we interviewed parents, the, their parents. I interviewed Sebastian's parents, That's your right. parents. My, my mom and dad are in the Brett Ernst's parents, right. John Caparulo's parents. We, I went to John Caparulo's house. Yeah. I haven't seen it in years. That's right. You went to Cap's house. Came out. I don't know if anybody watches it even anymore. I don't even know where, where you can see it. It's Netflix? Right, it's some, I had the DVD. Somewhere. No, I think it was on HBO it. Max. We were in the Air Force. And, uh, you were in the Air Force? Yeah. Oh, cool. Very nice. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> no, tell him. He's, got, sure a, he's got a great backstory. I'm sure you've talked about this. So yeah, yeah. We I, won't, I won't make your listeners good. here, but we'll, we'll talk after. We actually have yeah. not. We've never really we dug have into your... It, not yeah. really. You, uh, sk- yeah. you skate over yeah. it. It's about it. It's about art. It's something you don't want to do in the Air Force? I was a medic. Oh, shit. Okay. Where were you stationed? Texas, Las Vegas, Reno Valley. Cool. Very nice. And now he's a comic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's the normal trajectory. Yeah, for sure. So, so we we okay, so we read, like do this tour, and then I think it was right after. Did you win the Oscar? So the right tour, after. Yeah. So right, what happened right, was is right my after. movie West Bank Story came out. It's a comedy musical about Israelis and Palestinians. It takes place between two falafel restaurants in the West Bank. It's about an Israeli soldier. He falls in love with a Palestinian girl. Her family owns one restaurant. His family owns the uh, her fa- his family owns the other. It's warring houses like Romeo and Juliet. So it's a short film. It's a musical. It's a comedy. I, it came out in 2005, uh, January of 2005. What's your name? Fatima. My name is Fatima. Terrorist! Occupier. You see the wall they're building around our restaurant? We're gonna build it. We're gonna build the land. We're gonna build it. There are religious classes. Let me come to your balcony tonight to annoy your parents and neighbors by singing you a really overdramatic song about feelings and love. What? And I had gone around the town with it, and I had a manager and agent. And in September, we did the documentary. Right. We shot it. So for the next 10 months, I was just editing that documentary with Dan and Jim. Right. And, and that, we'll and talk then, about that later, but that was that, a whole different right. mo- monster. Then that came out in 2006 at the Toronto Film Festival right. in September. Right. And by December, I was on a short list for the Academy Awards right. for my movie from a year and a half before, <laughs> two years before, which I was like, oh shit, how'd that happen? And by February, or January of 07, it was announced that I was nominated for an Oscar. So right. like this weird trajectory right. happened. And then in February of 2007, where the Oscar, that's when I won the Oscar. And so it kind of, it's weird. My, my short film had a very strange existence because it had a huge splash coming out at Sundance. And then it kind of, Went around the world and did its thing, and I thought it was going to die out. And then two years later, it, it, gets, life. it wins an Oscar, and now it has an even bigger splash. So now I'm doing the same meetings around town that I did before, the same studio, same production companies. But instead of meeting the mid-level people, now I'm meeting all you the You had bosses. an Oscar in your hand. Yeah, so I, do you we know, have, so I, I went, we have the speech? I made a comedy musical about Israelis and Palestinians that takes place between two falafel stands in the West Bank. And it's a movie about peace and about hope. And... Uh, to be able to get this award just goes to show that there's so many other people out there who support that notion that when it comes to the situation between Israelis and Palestinians, hope is not hopeless. And on another note, I know a lot of people in America are probably watching and asking, what are the short films? Well, a lot of them are made by directors who are trying to get noticed, and I think in a lot of ways we represent the little guy because we don't have big studios behind us or big name actors or a lot of times the, the budgets we need, and it relies on perseverance and stick and hustle and a dedication and loyalty from a cast and crew who are doing it for pennies, if not for nothing. So I'd be remiss if I were to take this award and not thank my co-writer, Kim Ray, my producers, Pascal Vigelzi, Amy Kim, Ashley Jordan, Ravi Mohotra, and my composer, Yuval Ron, and last but not least, the two people who 
never doubted me, even when I doubted myself. My mother, who's here in the audience, Kathy, and my father, Dan, is watching. I love you. Thank you. For the record, I, and I, because I show that speech to like friends and people, like he's like my, I'm proud of my, you know, little brother here. <laughs> <laughs> you said and you got a little teary eyed. No, I, I've choked up a couple times when I've watched your speech, and to this day I still do sometimes because it's so heartfelt and it's really not Hollywood and bullshit. Like, f fucking Jack Nicholson is sitting in the front going. Yeah, they cut the Jack Nicholson. It's a fucking big deal. No, but. but I, listen, I'll you, be honest with you, it was a total blackout for me. And I remember none of it. And, and it's if like I may, I watched your it's speech, and if I may, speech, yeah. I was. That's a sign. Mm. The Beverly Hills thing, literally. <laughs> that's a sign. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what was I gonna say? I was just really moved by the by the speech. And fun fact, Ari actually cast me to play the lead Arab guy in the movie, That's true. the dad. So like, the brother. Was what, it the brother? The brother. Sorry, yeah, yeah. And there was something with comedy I committed to, and I just needed them. I don't know what I can't really remember. Schedule, what it was. schedule, schedule conflict. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I couldn't do it, and then he hired Joey Neighbor, who's a good friend of ours, yeah. and, and he killed it. But you know, sometimes in, in your career, you're like, fuck, I should have taken an Oscar yeah, like, award winning movie. Like that's, you saw that Oscar happen, you're like, motherfucker. <laughs> and so I was uh, ha like proud and happy like that you did it. But a part of me was just like, you know, I was weighing comedy and acting at the time. Like, what's more important? Yeah. What's going to pay Listen, the bills? That's every Hollywood right? story has the stories of I wish I took this or that. I, I have them, too. I mean, yeah, you can't know. What did, what did you turn down that that? became successful um well so here's what happened so when i won the oscar there was this giant mountain of pressure on me now mm. so everyone's saying it was great what are you going to do next mm -hmm. and even i'm like oh fuck what am i going to do and right. i got really really precious not not because i thought i was so great but because i was so afraid of failure we have and, to live up to something yeah else. and i was so afraid that if the next thing i do isn't as good they're going to say i'm a one-trick pony and, I, and you know when you're a first-time director they're not giving you the best scripts on the pile. They're giving you the dog shit ones they have at the studio and saying, can you fix this? Oh, so right. you're reading all of these not great scripts and you're like, and, and I'm having panic attacks. I'm like, I have to fix this. I don't know how to fix this. Yeah. I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So I said no to a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. And some of that stuff I'm glad I didn't do because it bombed. Although you never know, maybe I would have done it better or maybe it would have resulted in relationships that would have trans, you know, transpired into something else later. So you just never know. You some waited a long time. Too. Well, after you won the I Oscar. waited and because you, I said no, and then I then there's things I went after, and then they didn't happen. But what, it, it what took was your, five what, years, That's what dude. I'm saying. What was your first movie? Was it? Uh, um, it was something the called. Duff? Well, my first official movie was, was the, the Duff. Duff yeah, the CBS Duff. films. But right. before that, I did something called Aim High, which was with Warner Brothers, with uh, a production company that they then said, "Hey, we have another movie called The Duff. Do you want to do the Duff? We I liked working that. with you. We want to do a feature film." But that was five years after you won an Oscar. You said no. To, you said more. no for five years. Pro probably six years. Um, I was too picky at the beginning, based on fear. Yeah. And then once I started to kind of see, it was interesting. So once I started to see some of the movies I had said no to come out, mm -hmm. and I watched them, I went, "Oh, okay. You can make it better. It's gonna Ooh. change. I kind of get it now." So here's one that I wish I said. What yet. was Phil saying the whole time? Your agent. They, is Phil still your agent? Yeah, Port? they they you I know love Phil, by the way. they would give advice and you know they can only advise some things that they thought I was making a mistake and some things they thought you know they were listen there are certain things I felt pushed into that I said no to that I'm glad I said no to right and there are certain things that I said no to that I wish I said yes one that I wish I said yes to was um, what happens in Vegas with with uh, uh, Ashton Kutcher and Cameron Diaz oh, yeah, you got offered that, that? well I didn't get offered it no that's that's too well, much to say you were considered but they were coming to me and saying we want you to come meet with with Ashton about it. And at the time, I was working on something with Vince. Mm. The script felt very close to the breakup. Mm. I kind of was skeptical that they were gonna get Cameron Diaz, because they always said, we're gonna get this person, this person. And I'm like, I don't know if this is enough to draw me away from the other thing that I'm working on. I, so I kind of said, no, I won't do it. I don't wanna do it. And even Ashton, because I met with Ashton later, he's like, you really don't wanna talk about it? I'm like, why? Well, I, I wasn't prepared to talk about it. We could. So we actually hit it off and talked about other films to, to possibly do together. But I didn't do that one. Didn't come out for like two years. Came out. Eighty-four million dollars. I'm like, right. shit. Uh, right. And when I saw it, I went, oh, yeah, I That's get it. Why. I yeah. get it. It was way funnier than when I read it. You know, it, you, it, things change. Also, there, movie, movies that are set in Vegas tend to do well because right. Vegas is a wish fulfillment right. city. Everyone around the it's world wants to see about Vegas. Landmarks yes. and shit. Yeah. So you know, there's a lot of things I didn't understand at the time. Now 
I look at movies differently when I read them. Yeah. I understand how to do it better. I still have a panic attack sometimes when it's bad. I'm like, oh my God, I can't fix this. I don't know what to right. do. But I calm myself down. So I've just learned, here's, what I, here's another thing I've learned. My process is to freak out at first. Now, <laughs> you, what the hardest thing is in, like in, in doing anything as in a, in a creative sense is, you know, you're always being told, you have to listen to your gut. You have to listen to your gut. And, you know, your gut's got to lead you. And you're like, yeah, my gut, my gut. What I realized is the voice that is in your head that's your gut sounds a lot like the voice that's in your head, head that is fear. Mm. And sometimes it's hard to de decipher between your gut and the intuition you have to follow and just run-of-the-mill fear that's there to fuck you up. Mm. So early on, I thought I was listening to my gut, but what I was really listening to was fucking fear. Sure. Fear of failure, but of now I understand a little bit better how to put the fear away like I don't want to do this movie I'm like oh it's because I'm a little bit afraid of these scenes I don't think I can do it well but what if I changed it okay so now I know how to work past it you never master it but you learn to it's like um, uh, constant chronic pain you learn to live with it right as You're opposed to enemy. defeating it's it a little handicap Yes, so that's that's part of whenever I teach a class at USC, I talk about the difference between you're teaching at USC. I didn't know. I, that. I used to. I did it for a few years. Yeah. Do, what don't you do? I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know. I'll fly Real plane. quick, before I forget, uh, Matt Damon passed on Avatar. You, you know that whole story. Oh, right? there's a million of these stories. There's like you know, there's certain big actors that pass on movies that become blockbusters because they didn't like the script or their agent told them there wasn't enough money or whatever the case is. Um, the second thing, and I just want to kind of connect this story. I was on, I didn't, we haven't talked about this on the podcast uh, yet, but I was on Punked for uh, four episodes. I remember. I did four episodes of Punked, season two. You know, I auditioned for Punked. You did? Punk'd, yeah. Oh, you didn't tell it was, me that? It was terrible. You did not tell me that. You actually went in, I think, the same day and after me. And then oh. you told me you got it. I'm like, fuck. What did I? And then you oh, told me you? how you got it. And I'm like, oh, it's brilliant. As an actor. No, I'll tell you what happened. So because I knew one of the producers, so and on, I felt I, I'm like, I'm I can book do I could do this. What's so hard? <laughs> no, I clammed up. I was terrible. I was terrible. So Alana, Alana, mm -hmm. what was her last name? Uh, Alana Darsky. Alana Darsky. Alana Darsky, sweet gal, uh, was Ashton Kutcher's agent's assistant. Mm -hmm. And you were friends with her. Mm -hmm. And she called they, you. They said and they're you, looking you, for people. And I'm like, you should I would crush that. She's right. like, are you sure? I'm but like, then you recommended trust me. me. <laughs> and then I'm like, just get me in the room. I'll take care of the rest. Now, uh, I'm not usually that confident when it comes to that kind of stuff. Dude, when the one-on-one -on -one sign goes down. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about news. That's it's, funny that you were like, you said that I'll design. crush that. I'll tell you a backstory. With no, I went in and I was terrible and it was really. What did you do? I don't remember. I just like, what did they make you do? I'll basically, tell you what I did. basically they put you on the spot. Like, Convince me, <laughs> do something, and I, I did not do it well. I I don't know what I was thinking I was gonna do when I got in there. I didn't do it well. It was very awkward, and I walked out and I went, I will never do that again. And then I know what you did. You went in there. I'll tell you what I did. Can yeah, I, yeah, go. Tell you tell me you, you tell them what you think I, I did. I know what you did. You went in there, and um, they said something. Hold on, can I give give the quick backstory? Yeah, he's friends with this the agent's assistant, Ashton Kutcher, Alana. Who was very very sweet, and you recommended me. I think is how I, it I think maybe you should go see my friend Ahmed at the comedy yeah, store. Is maybe, what you said. Maybe. So she showed up showed up at the comedy store one night, like on a Wednesday, like on a dead night, and I went up on stage and I was in a really weird place in my life at the time. I was I was uh, crushing like a mustache, like a cop mustache, <laughs> like right. a big black mustache. Yeah, and I was just whatever, and I did my thing, and then she came up to me afterwards and she goes, "Hey, you're." You're really funny. I like the characters you do. Ari Sandel recommended me. Blah, blah, blah. Do you want to come in and meet uh, Jason Goldberg, who was the EP, right. and then his he was partner. the writer. I forgot his name. Doesn't right. matter. Audience doesn't care. Let's go. At any rate. <laughs> Thank you. At any rate, that's how I got the uh, meeting. It wasn't even an audition. It was a meeting. So yeah. you, tell yeah. me tell me what All you of think these, I did. But when I say audition too, it was also a meeting. You walked into the room. And but what did in, I do? In a in a, in a office building you walk in the room you do the thing and you go get in the elevator and you walk out so right. what you did was you went in there they said something <laughs> that you then got really pissed off about them and called them like racist and and fuck you you know I'll, 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 i don't want to be on this show go fuck yourself how dare you insult me that way and they were so like oh my god what did we do and you walked out you're like fuck you in your show and you walked well, out and you version. sat by the elevator 
and you sat by the elevator and all of a sudden they come out and they'd be like, listen, I'm so sorry. We, we didn't mean it that way. It's our apology. Please, we'd love you to come back in. And you went, you got punked. And they went, holy so so fuck. You know what? I like your version better. Because <laughs> I do it. Yeah, quick, quick, storyteller. No, bro. that's not what happened. Well, but I like mine. I'll tell you what happened. No, that's actually, that's intense. I wish I would have done that. <laughs> that's not what happened? No. I went in. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. And I sat down. There was Jason Goldberg and uh, and the writer guy. And I was really nice. And I, they were like, have you seen our show? And I was like, yeah. I said, I'm a big fan. Did oh, you? Right. Did you did you see the episode with Justin Timberlake and Polly Shore? I was like, yeah, man, those were so so great. We're looking for actors. We didn't think we were because they didn't think they were going to get picked up for season two. Right, it happened fast. That's right. And you and you were kind of they, they needed to cast like you people. Didn't, you didn't care that much about the show. And you're I, not ba- sure if I basically to do just it. said they were like, you know, this is our th- concept. You know, we're looking for straight edge actors who can just play a part. What do you think about it? And I was like, I said, I'm really honored and flattered that you guys called me in here. This is the concept is like super cool. I'm trying to just do like some bigger things in my career right now. This might be a little beneath me. Mm. Um, no offense, but I just, I, you know, I'm writing my own material. I'm on the road, but I'm going to watch the show and, and, uh, and then I'll support it. And then I had kind of, I said, thanks for, you know, making time to meet me. And I just walked out of the room real politely and they were just like, and then I came right back in. I was like, I'm joking. I'll take the part. And that's how I got it. I don't know if that's the case. That's I swear to God. not what you swear told to God. me. No, because no here, okay, I'll tell you what I told you. I'm amending my story. No, 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 I'm amending no, 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 my story. Here's what Can I, I tell you? Can I right, tell you? Here, here's the backstory. Do you know a comedian named Adam Hunter? No. You should. We just worked with him. He's he's a monster comedian. Super Adam funny. Hunter. Adam Comedian on Instagram. He was, I just saw him last night. He killed for 40 minutes straight. Machine Gun Kelly kind of shit. He... He called me because I did four episodes of Punk and then I got fired. I'll talk about that later. Fired because I did an episode with Halle Berry that got too popular. And they're like, people are going to recognize you. And I'm like, I hope. <laughs> and they're like, we can't use you. People are going to, we can't do an episode, you know, spend half a million bucks. And the people were punking go, oh, you're the Halle Berry, fucking whatever. So, um, so we did the thing and I, and I got fired. But Adam Hunter called me and he goes, Hey man, I got an audition for punk like season three or whatever. How do I like, what did you do? And I told him what I just told you guys. And he goes, he goes, cool. He called me after his audition. He goes, Hey man, I got physically escorted out of the (laughs) office building. I go, what the fuck did you do? He goes, you told me what you did. And I did that. And I was like, what did you do? He goes, he kind of repeated your story. So I think maybe you're correlating the two. He was like, I sat there. I told him to fuck off. I kicked the chair. <laughs> like he got this. Here's what I remember now. Here's and the, and, and the security. Here, here's a 20 to, second. I'm going to do a 20 second recap. Uh, Thank you. Redacted. Um, <laughs> you went in there acting like you didn't really give a shit about it. You did say, yeah, that wasn't kind mean. Of, I didn't no, say no, 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 but you were, you were, but this was, you was, this was an act. And like, yeah, we're well, so you know, not kind of non plus, not that into it, so so whatever. Then they said, um, then you said, hey, I think I'm looking at doing bigger stuff, blah blah blah. Right. Then they said something about, they said something about being an actor, blah blah blah, and that you you were a comedian and you feigned being upset and you got you said I'm offended and and told them to fuck off and you stormed out. What I know is I, I never is used di- the f word. Fine, but what but I know I is you stormed out. You stormed out. That was the bit that you were doing. Is you stormed okay. out and they met you by the elevator and that's when you said you got punked. Because mm. in your story you're like, "Oh, I'm kidding. I want the job." No, bro, the whole story is is you punked them and that's what the fucking convinced them. I know, but I'm saying but put I your story away. Never have your story okay, again. You know what? Take I my like story. <laughs> yeah. Take Come story. on. It's better. It's Much better story. Better story. Well, what story do you like better? <laughs> Thanks. All right, all right. That's why we brought you on, the, on yeah. our podcast. All right. What's next? Let's move forward. So let, actually, let's go backwards. So so <laughs> you win the Oscar. You you finally take your gig five years later. Yeah. Right. Um, well, no, I I went in. I actually the, took many movies up till there, and they all fell apart. And that's mm-hmm. another part of the learning lesson is I said no to things for probably two or three years, and f- or maybe two years. In 2008, I finally I said yes to something, and it got killed by the writer strike, and then it got revived, and then this which one? It, it was a movie you never heard of. It never happened. Yeah. So and then and then the studio Fox Atomic, which was a wing of Fox movies, uh, Studios, right. they make twenty million dollar and under movies that are comedies right. or horrors. You told me that. I remember that. That's who was making this movie, 
and they closed. They folded because they were doing so poorly. So my movie got killed. And mine was the next up. So I was like, oh, my God. Then I had another movie with a group of produce, uh, big producing partners They they with a different movie. They broke up. So that movie got killed. Then I had a movie um, that was supposed to be at Paramount, but Paramount was a $10 million high school movie, party movie. Right. And then all of a sudden, Paranormal Activity came out. And, Paranormal, and Paramount said, we made that movie for nothing. Why are we making one movie for $10 million when we can make 10 movies for $1 million right. on a micro budget? Let's bet on and, all the horses. Right, and if right. one of them hits, we make our money. Right. Can you make your party movie? It really for, is like betting on horses. Well, they said, can you make your $10 million movie for a million? And I right. went, no, there's no, there's literally no way. So that movie died. So I had probably 25 movies die before wow, the duff yeah. happened. So by the time I got to the, the opportunity to do the duff, I was... I mean, gleeful to do it, but also like, oh my God, can I even direct anymore? I haven't been on set and yelled action. The, the in Duff's five a really years. fun, like, yeah. teen kind of rom com, right? Yeah. Ken Jung's in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was, a, you know, a great first, like, you know, swing out of the gate, you know? Um, but then you were writing. I remember mm -hmm. there was a time in your life, and I want to go back because you went to USC film school. Right, for right? grad school. Grad school. Mm -hmm. um, but your major was directing. Directing. Mm -hmm. Um, and now you go back and you teach there sometimes. I, I did for about six years. I, I was teaching, yeah. There was a segment of your life when you won the Oscar, Bill Clinton's agent called you and said, your speech was great. I think you, we can tour We can tour your speech. Yeah, like, it, tour, it, it's like, an agent from a company called the Harry Walker Agency. They're like the biggest agency <laughs> I just to represent was so cool. I'm speakers. Like, and they said, we represent people. What, what they, they literally <laughs> called me the day after the Oscars. <laughs> And they said, "How did they get your number? Like who? Who knows? Somebody. Gave uh, it. Oh, I think at that time, actually, I had my number on my website, which is weird because 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 after the Oscars, I had like five thousand people call me, and I'm like, ah, maybe I should take this off. <laughs> so they said, we don't call people; people call us. Oh, okay. and I'm like, all right, like, and people are calling us because they want to book you for public speaking. They're like, right. do you do public speaking? I'm like, oh, yeah, all the time. I'm, I'm like, you know, I have I've no always idea. I've always told Ari, you should be a fucking stand up comic, man." He um, never. You, well, so here's what's interesting. Might. So the the he's very funny. The teaching, the university that I went to, which was the documentary making the documentary with you guys, right? And hours upon hours upon hours, every single day, interviewing each of you of what does it take to have to do to do comedy, to stand up in front of people, to change your act, to work on your act, weirdly paid off because when I started doing professional speaking for two years, I did professional speaking. I adopted a lot of the stuff I learned from you guys, which was because I would go up. Are we basically stole our cadence? Yes. <laughs> and presence and material. Not material. I would go up for you know. <laughs> I would show the movie. But you're a natural anyway. And then you I would always... answer questions. I would actually talk for 25 or 30 minutes and just right. do a shtick. Right. To I spoke to college groups, uh, uh, Jewish groups, charity organizations. You I, had a I bit spoke... of a, you had a script kind of. Uh, no, Not I don't think that I read off of in my head. Like no, in I'm the same you, way you do your bit. Right, but you had like answers, like when people would 100%, ask you some. Yeah, 100%. You had and I had stories that were go to, go to and, yeah, stories, explanations. Talked about your and, dad, all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, Ari's dad is one of the most fascinating people I've ever met in my life. Uh, Israeli, moved to America, just like my dad, just lived, like really created the American dream. Yeah. But when you do an impression of him, it's so spot on and hilarious. Yeah. How is he? He's good. I love him, man. Tell He's him, good, send yeah, him my I best. Uh, so, you, so you go around the world. You went to like Russia. You, you went to like hundred countries. I showed the movie to. A, you made a lot, lot of money doing that. Well, not showing the movie. The movie made no money. No, no, no. I, I made the, the, public, the money that I made public was in public speaking. Listen, yeah. public speaking in that capacity is a blip. You know, you're, I only did it for about a year and a half, and you know, then nobody cares about you because you're not the most recent winner, right? So who, who <laughs> wants to hear about the winner from two years ago? So for about a year and a half, I did it every, you know, couple weeks or every couple months, and it was nice. And that's actually what paid for me to live in yeah. between make because I wasn't making movies. Mm. And I, I was really having, you know, struggling to, to you know, you were making a lot. You, I'm not going to disclose it, but I remember you telling me like what you were getting paid per. Yeah, game. it was. It was from a speaker's perspective. I was getting pennies. I was and, getting the base. The right. Base. I mean, but, there are speakers. Still a lot. There are speakers who make fifty, sixty, one hundred and fifty thousand. They're flying you first class really, and putting you in hotels. Like Two fifty per. Oh, for sure. I, yeah. I think when she first started, she was making a million. At, at one point, oh I'm like, God. like Barack Obama will probably could make a million. Yeah. 
probably now we probably make 500 or 250. Damn, I got in the wrong industry. Oh, listen, it's the best. Get into politics. Didn't you do a TED Talk, though? I mean, it's got like, a couple views on YouTube. Nah, no, I, I was Everybody making. Go check that out. In Doha, it was in Doha, Qatar, <laughs> and they didn't mic the thing right. So it looks, but I wasn't trying to be oh, funny. Really? It's just a TED Talk. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. Was it good? Did you like it? I liked it. Oh, okay. Then you well, know I, what? Go I, see it. I Go watch it. my TED Talk. I gave a speech at a terrorism conference that was put on by the <laughs> Pentagon. <laughs> And they call me, and I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, I'm like, you. I'm like, have you seen the movie? They're like, yeah, yeah, we just feel like it might be good as a, let's call it a palate cleanser. It's going to be a lot of heavy stuff, and maybe something with a little bit of hope in it might be appreciated. And I went, mm, all right. So they flew me to D.C., and I sat through like two and a half hours of the most heart-wrenching stories of people affected by terrorism. And there, there are people from all over the world. There are ambassadors and representatives from countries wow. all over the world at this Pentagon event, and people are in tears, and all of a sudden they go, let's watch West Bank Story. And I go, oh, <laughs> shit. So I did my little spiel. I did a thing. People made some, you know, did some laughing, and at some point after the speech, I'm walking in the hallway, and there's people, and they're shaking hands and diplomats. So this guy comes up to me and goes, he's like, I'm from Ethiopia. Your movie was great. I want to give you the Ethiopian Medal of Freedom. And I went, what? You got it. Well, hold on. and I said, thank you. And he gives me this, um, this medal. And I'm like, holy shit. And the next day I'm walking the hallways and I see like, that guy's got a medal of freedom and that guy's got a medal of freedom. Like, oh, dude. <laughs> Everybody had it. And I started looking like, oh, it's kind of like you think you get a trophy store. But it was still, it's, I mean, it's still pretty great. I love it. Made out of plastic. So, no, it was, nah, you know, it was nice. I mean, he may as well just fucking give you the sign here. 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 All right. There I'm you go. Give you I don't know who's doing your set decoration. One on one. Actually, speaking of an Oscar. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we brought this for you. <laughs> this is beautiful. But weren't you like, How nice. you were like traveling. I just want to just specify this because it's really interesting the way you told it to me. He's like going through airports, traveling with, with, the, with the Oscar. Yeah, a couple, I, well, I went to Israel so, to visit my family. But like people, like the airport security was, you know, didn't they like pulled it out? I went to Israel like, to visit my family and they wanted me to bring it out there so they could see it. <laughs> so... Every airport on the way there and the stopovers it would react to it differently. You know, someone like, oh my God, is this thing to take pictures? Like when I was in, Sweet uh, in Switzerland, they're like, holy shit, taking pictures of it. And then I land in Tel Aviv and they're like, what is this? I'm like, um, it's an Academy Award. Did you pack it yourself? I'm like, yeah. I was like, did anyone, who gave it to you? I'm like, mm, the Academy. The, the Oscar, yeah. The so Oscar. then they started to realize, okay, it's real, it's not a bomb. Then I go, can we take a picture with it? I said, yeah, yeah. yeah it's kind of, you know. Yeah, who's um, <laughs> some of your inspiration as far as like filmmakers? You mean? Yeah. Hi, I'm right here. Probably, yeah, probably. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, there's been a lot of people that I always kind of really respected and, and tried, wanted my career to follow or at least be similar to, which is people who have made the transition from comedy to other types of just comedy or or even drama. I really mm -hmm. respect like Jay Roach, um, Todd Phillips. Adam McKay, mm. you know, those guys are making really cool movies now that are still funny, but really smart. Sure. The, the, probably the most amazing crossover to me is Todd Phillips. To go from The Hangover I know, right? to The Joker. Right. I mean, that's like two different, that movie. That movie it's just two phenomenal. different creative brains. It's crazy. I think The phenomenal. Joker, you know, a lot of people, it, were, it was so funny when the movie came out. <laughs> there were so many mixed messages about it, but I personally, as a comic and a filmmaker and an actor, was like wow this is fucking brilliant like it's so yeah. dark and everything smart everything about it was great but and also I'm subtle not a huge... but subtle too it was had a it's more subtle melodic... yeah because it's a real dramatic I, i'm not a huge um comic book i mean i i like them i can appreciate them but i don't gravitate to go see them always when i saw that one i went oh damn yeah dude, that's a well cinematically it was thing. beautifully shot yeah yeah, and, and yeah. i like Phillips. the way it was more realistic the joker's character batman is the worst superhero but well i just think the way todd phillips the way even like the movie was lit yeah you know it, again it had a very kind of melodic you know cadence to it like well the funny I, I thing enjoyed is, watching it as a student i asked todd phillips to come give a speech at usc mm. and that's after he had just done old school mm. and he was just at that in that Ooh, talk Vince Vaughn movie, right was Vince Vaughn was in at, in that talk he was talking about he has in his new movie was going to be starsky and hutch Okay, which also Vince Vaughn's in. Right. Crush. And, and and Snoop Dogg is Snoop in it. Dogg, and Vince, so, yeah, right. so that was still early in his career. Right. So, you know, it's funny that 
that director who did Starsky and Hutch is, and then later would do the Joker. The Joker. Damn, and what was his first film? Go. Remember the his mo- first film? Go. No, no, that's Doug. Wasn't Lyman. it Go? Oh, that's Doug Lyman. Yeah. Uh, right, actually, right. no. Was that Doug Lyman? No, somebody else. No, you're um, right. Yeah, it was Doug Lyman. No, his first film was um, Road Trip. That's right. Tom with Green. with uh, with. I can't remember their names. Brendan. Brendan. Yeah, yeah. I forgot his last name. I can't remember his name Oof. either. No, you know what his first movie was? Is a mo- I think it's called Frat House, and it was a it was a mockumentary documentary where he went and actually did a documentary inside of a fraternity house, and it was supposed to be unbelievable. And when the national fraternity found out, they threatened to sue him, and they had to like burn all the tapes. They had to bit. It was Jeez. it's banned. Like barely anyone's ever seen it. I saw it, but at that time it was just by VHS tape being passed around like bootlegs. Right. right. But that was technically his first movie, and then his second movie was a documentary, where he followed the band Fish. Oh wow! Oh, and wow. then he did feature films. Right. Do you yeah. feel like they're making? Um, oh, I, I feel like they are less comedies now. Like no, they're making of, bad bad comedies. Or I don't know what's happening, <laughs> but Netflix or whatever they're putting out a comedy here and there. But it used to be like every year there'd be a big blockbuster because comedy. Because here's the thing: not, nobody goes. The younger generation does not go to theaters very much like we did when mm-hmm. we were younger. Right. And they certainly don't go to see a comedy. A comedy is going to be on at home. You watch with your friends or your, or your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. The and only thing that's going to, the only thing that's going to bring them out to a theater is an event, what I call an event movie, a Marvel. movie. So, but it can be any event. It can be or an event Harry in Potter. that it's mar- yeah. Marvel. Right. So it's spectacle. Right. Yeah. It could be a cultural event. Like let's say get out or crazy rich Asians that got people sure. to the theaters because that's an event. Sure. So a comedy is rarely going to be that anymore. Rom com even that less sucks. so. Yeah. So you're just gonna see less. Like, look how how many teen the Duff would never come out in the theater now. Now it would be on streaming. Right. And I honestly, as much as I want movies to come out in theaters, I wouldn't want the Duff to come out in the theater because it would probably get crushed. Movies do kill it just coming out like on Netflix. There's yeah. A few it's just a different comedies that come out and they're great and they get good traction, but I just feel like they're making less, even if they are not going to the theaters. It, they're just not. In general, they money. they make less. Here's what I would say also though. What they're doing more of is streaming series, and as a filmmaker, that's I love that. Because like the Apple TV series, just like eight episodes, any, right? Because right. you can get more into character. Yeah, like you, you get, take you a, get show a better, like better bang for your Emily buck. in Paris. Okay, yeah. let's say that that was a movie. Okay, but as a as a running series, you can get into each character, and there's a lot more storyline. You can do a lot more. more even um, something like Dave. If you're, I'm sure you've I watched Dave. Dave. So great. Dave, the first season of Dave, if you watch it, you're like, okay, I get it. After the first episode and. First three or four, you're like, all right, and then it starts to unfold. And you're like, yeah. holy shit, That's the character great. breakdown are amazing in the show. So it's I a different. It. Is it on Amazon or Netflix? Uh, it's Amazon. Hulu has it. Something. I don't know. I have a jailbroke Fire Stick, so I'm just watching. It. I'm not gonna support it. <laughs> it's no, it's good. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, the dude's a really good rapper anyway, and then they gave him a, a yeah. TV show, and it basically follows him. His name's Lil Dicky, and they. They follow him as a rapper, a white Jewish it's rapper. It's based off of his whole life. It's very personal. He was born. A, he was born with a deformity. His penis is deformed. Yeah, exactly. That has he has two holes in his penis. This is real. It's a hypospadias. And he has to hold one of the holes. Do closed. you know this show, Wolf? <laughs> yeah. He has you, to hold this, this. He has to hold one of the holes closed to pee, and so he grew up as a kid with this tremendous the insecurity. Fuck? Tremendous insecurity. Is this Never, a reality show? This is, no, this is, this is a show based on his life, and he has he dr- he grew up with this tremendous insecurity, being intimate with women. And here he is adopting a an art form that is all about masculinity and bravado. You know, hip hop is all about I'm the best and I'm the badass and I slay chicks and I'm about you know whatever. And his name's Little. And he's basically yeah. living his life as a fraud. And he's a great rapper too, though. And he's good at it, and he's really funny. And so this is this amazing dichotomy of who he wants to be versus who he really is. Right. It gets really personal. But like his it's, Jewish it's family, amazing. like, and they're just like, I don't understand. I don't know. The it's a good, it's a well. good. I'll it's check a it out. Show. Listen, Vicky. in a world where we're trying to find new things. Right. You got to hand it to him. That's a very oh, okay. unique storyline. Yeah. All right. That's good. Fair enough. Anything else in the works? Yeah. What's up? What's going on right now? Um, and then, and then, and then, and then tell your best Hollywood tale. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I may have told them all. Um, I, you, uh, you told a lot. To I, uh, what am I working on next? I'm working on a Christmas movie. Um, that's a musical it's about a an elf who has to save christmas and i as a jew i love christmas yeah, yeah, yeah. so i'm very excited about the possibility of doing it so i hope it happens um it's still a ways still a ways off i've been writing a couple things on my own you know it's a little it's always yeah. chasing 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 yeah that's about it in my best hollywood story i think i gave you my best hollywood i don't think i have anything that comes to head, comes to mind i mean just talking out loud the last whatever 
half hour, hour you've been here. Play, play my speech, and then I'll just walk out. Yeah. Well, we're definitely going to play your speech. <laughs> my best Hollywood story. I'm sure you've told every Hollywood story. Have you no, I, I have. I've barely told any Hollywood stories. stories? No, dude. I've barely sure scratched the surface. Like, I have. Dude, you know me. I fucking used to run yeah, the, whole like the whole podcast. Scene, you know? I would think it's your Hollywood story. Like, Sunset Boulevard, you know. They should have called it I'm at I'm at Boulevard for five years because there was a moment. Maybe where there's I was, one where you were a, a peacemaker. You know, I've dipped my hat in a lot of the. <laughs> no, I want you to tell your best one, it, I dude. I it could be I anything. One. You know, when you here's the thing. Look, look, when you, let, have it. Let it be like a wide-eyed experience. Yeah, look, but Tom Morello. To, you, I don't know if you watch the podcast with Tom. I watch all of them. Tom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Condescending. <laughs> Condescending. Fucking Kenny over what here. What did Tom talk about? Uh, he. So you remember, I don't know if you were there a couple of times. He used to have like barbecues and parties at his house at the Dang mall. Well and yeah. He bought Rob Lowe's old house. Okay. And it's this really nice kind of one level, like cool home. It's not over chicy and produced, but nice. And he'd have these parties. And at one point, it was the last party he threw. He was 40 years old. He talks about it on the podcast. He goes, I stopped throwing parties at my house because like randoms were just showing up. Hmm. Right. So he's like, like the lead singer from Jet was smoking a cigarette in my living room. Remember the band Jet? Yeah. They were like kind of famous, kind of not. Okay. Like a one hit wonder. And Tom went up to him and he's like, hey man, you mind uh, not smoking in my house? And he goes, the lead singer of Jet just goes, and just ashed on the floor. Like, no big deal. And then some chick went up to him uh, later. Those are the owners, by the way, Jake and Dave. Uh, came up to him and, and he was. She was. They were like, "Hey, do you know whose house we're at?" And they were like, "Yeah, Tony Morello." <laughs> anyway, yeah, he I ended don't, up so leaving. Here's the thing. When you when you put the word "best" on the request, I then it's a lot of pressure. It doesn't have to be your I best. Mean, it's just like a like a, a random funny a funny. It's got to be money, something yeah. funny that happened to I you in Hollywood or around know, Hollywood. Ahead of time. Actor, it could be no. a party. Yeah, dude, what do yeah, you mean? Maybe, maybe I, talk to you. <laughs> I always prep all right. Um, it could be anything, dude. It could be our like something we did. You know, uh, a, 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 it could be the, it could uh, it could be Wild one of the West Wild West tour, tour or something we did on the Wild West. Um, just our days out, like fucking crushing Hollywood. We used to crush are the we, streets. Are we gonna Hollywood. cut out the time it takes for me to think of something? No, Wolf take take amazing. your time. He'll Wolf, right you're cool. to it. Let's, Let's cut, cut and let me go pee real quick. That'd be great. I gotta leave actually. Let me, let me, let me. If I can't come up with something in the next minute, I gotta, I gotta do that. Bro, take just take a deep breath. I don't have it. I don't. I just, I just need one. We want to end it with, you know, hey, this is my best. Hollywood all right, here, time. I'll tell you a story. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, I don't know if it's the best, it's not the best, but it's just something that, you know, happened when I was shooting West Bank Story. Um, as an example of what can go wrong, will definitely go wrong. So we're shooting out in the middle of Santa Clarita, which is desert town outside of LA, in this fake, what the guy said was an Arab village. He right. built it, but it's totally architecturally wrong. It doesn't right. look like anything. <laughs> and I'm right. like, where did you do your research? He's like, oh, I watched CNN. And I'm like, okay. You know, we shot JAG. I, I did an episode of JAG. They shot a ton of stuff. Yeah. We yeah. shot Iron Man I, there. Yeah, yeah. After, because I, I told Peter we about this place, so I used it. It's called Blue Collar Ranch. Right. And right, it's right, a huge right. area, and we're shooting there, <laughs> and while we're shooting, um, the, uh, uh, there was a huge wildfire that started in the area. And at oh, first I go, oh, don't worry, it's going to be fine. Well, as we start to go on through the day, there's giant smoke clouds that literally cover the sky and ash is raining down. Oh shit. As we're shooting, we had to give everyone masks. Wow. There's so much ash falling from the sky that it looks like snow. Shit. I'm shooting in the middle of the day outside of LA in the desert and it looks like it's snowing. Did you because there's cut so that much footage? Ash. You had Hold to. On. So everyone's like, oh my God, this is what happens when you make a movie about Israelis and Palestinians. <laughs> the fucking God. end of the world. Yeah, the universe. The interesting is thing is though, on you. when we cut it, you'll never know. Really? You'll never see it. Nope. Seriously? But it's all there. If you want, if you were to pan to the left, this guy's covered which, in ash. Which, this guy's which covered scenes? in ash. Yeah. Um, the stuff that's in the village, the, the, the beginning really? of the movie. Yeah. I've watched the movie several times, so I have to go back and look at go that. Watch it, go and watch that's it. interesting. It's a little no, uh, tidbit no, of information. I don't no, know if it's the greatest story. No but. color correction or no. none of that? No, it's a great story. Mar marginal color correction, yeah. But that's easy. Right. It just sets a dial switch. 
That's a great Hollywood tale. Yeah. By the way, if you're a filmmaker, comic, artist, whatever, this podcast is all friendly for that. And you've shared a lot of cool information today. So thank you. Yeah. Any last words? We can wrap it up. Uh, Brea. Brea. Oh, yeah. We'll be in Brea. Brea Improv. Brea Improv. Go to Brea Improv or just improv slash Brea, I guess, dot com. Uh, February 16th. Yep. It's a Wednesday. It's a big mm-hmm. place. It seats 500 people. Tell your friends. Um, this is Jam in the Van. Go to jaminthevan.com. Uh, go to their YouTube, Jam in the Van. They have music, comedy. It's a multiplex ex rehab center that they've converted into this cool artist friendly uh, structure next to an Islamic mosque, which mm-hmm. I'm, <laughs> makes, makes me happy. That's good. <laughs> Wolf Ramirez over here. Thank you, bud. Thanks, we Wolf. we have to start getting a camera on you, bro, like a GoPro or something. I want to. I want you to like be a part of it. And uh, Jack Higgins, who's our creative director, and um, the two Jakes who run this place. David, Ari. Any last words, Good. Blake? Good, man. Episode seven, right? Sure. Episode seven. I think it's six, but we're cool. <laughs> Check us out. Uh, at Ahmed Ahmed Comedy on Instagram. At, at Ari Blake Sandel. Dot Barty. Say it again. At Blake Dot Barty. At Ari Sandel. Don't follow me. You don't care what Whatever. I Whatever. He has we pictures care. of his we dog care. and cares. shit. But <laughs> that was fun. Thanks, bro. My pleasure, man. Thanks. Appreciate it, man. Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Be safe.